Good morning. This morning's scripture reading will be from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, and verses 6 through 10. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they had come to the border of Messia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Messia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Phil. It's great to see everyone this morning. It's a really uh, exciting time around here with Bible Bowl coming up. I know you've got plans to... Uh, be here and help with some of those things. Uh, Brad said they could use a few more houses. They're expecting some extra kids, and so it's not hard to do. All you have to do is have a place for them to sleep, and they can sleep just about anywhere. But they're going to be busy all day long, so it's not like you have to entertain them. But uh, Friday night and Saturday night, we'll get rid of them Sunday morning, send them back because we won all the prizes already, and uh, they can go home and, and think about the next year. So uh, if you can help with Bible Bowl, if you have a house, there are some sign-up sheets in the back, or you can talk to Brad and just let him know what's going on. So classes are coming up next quarter. They change your, your things in your bulletin. Be able to look at that and decide on a class. And uh, we have connect groups on Sunday night. I'm sure a lot of you are involved in those connect groups, and if you are not, please try and find one. Uh, also, here at the building is a group that meets as their own kind of connect group, and they have people who preach here. And normally, Anthony Bryant takes the most part of that, but every other month, he's gone. So in March, if you would like to be able to speak, let me know. Uh, this is one of the opportunities we have for people who are here just to be able to preach, and they would appreciate it very much. And so just let me know if you're interested in that. We've been talking a lot about evangelism and what that means about sharing the heart of God. And I think this is one of the stories today that talks a lot about that and about what that is and how we're actually able to do that. When you think about this, how do you decide who would listen to you? What do you believe? When somebody says, here is what happens, aliens landed in my backyard last night, do you believe them? Might depend on how well you know them. Might depend on a lot of things. We tend not to believe very much these days. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we've been told a whole lot of things that weren't true. And so we're very skeptical when things do that. I was looking at a product yesterday and I thought, this is great. This is a little pot that you can get, and the thing that attracts me is it's got lots of buttons. So if it's got a lot of buttons, it's bound to be good because there's got to be a setting on here somewhere that you know, will not only skin your chicken, but also cook it and make dressing for you as well. <laughs> and so I was looking at that, and I was going, you know, this looks like it might be good. And then I noticed the endorsement on the box. The endorsement is, as seen on TV. Now, does that make you want to buy it or not want to buy it? Uh, no, I don't think so. So you look up other things and it says, no, nah, let's don't buy that. As seen on TV, what kind of an endorsement is that? I mean, that's where we would go for information. That's where all the news is. That's where everything is that we would, and we don't believe it. Is it any wonder we have trouble believing somebody who would tell us about Jesus? How do you get people to believe you? I have a hard time with grandkids getting them to believe me. 
And that's because I've teased them so much and told them so many things that weren't true. They go, oh, no, that's not right. And they're pretty much right on that all the time. But there's got to be some time when we are able to understand, when we are able to be believed. And so we want to pick up today with the scripture that Phil's read to us. Paul is on a missionary trip, and he's actually come to the place where he does not know where to go. He's got to the end of the world, at least the end of his world, and he's not sure exactly how to go from here. And so you can see he's come from Jerusalem. He's come all the way up. They've gotten to Troas, and, you know, that's kind of the end of the landmass. If we go any further, we're going to have to sail. And they don't know how to get there. And, you know, he says, well, I'll just go a little bit further north. And uh, God says, no, you won't. This is one of the few times where you see God saying, no, I want you to go a certain direction. And so he's trying to think about this. Where do I go to find people who would be interested in hearing about God? In other words, who would believe me? And so he's thinking about this, and he has a dream at night, and there's a man who says, come over to Macedonia and help us. Not even a city, just that whole area of Macedonia. And so the conclusion is... God has called us to Macedonia to preach the gospel. Well, if God has called you to Macedonia to preach the gospel, and you know God has sent you a vision, man, this has got to be the exact time when it ought to go just perfect, don't you think? It seems like it. I mean, this is more what we would face as well. Because it's not like Jerusalem where they've had years and years and hundreds of years of history and kings and prophets and all of these people who have come before just to introduce one guy, Jesus Christ. These are people who have no clue about anything else. They don't have that history. They don't have that background. You can't even use that history or background. And so how am I going to get them to believe me when I tell them about Jesus Christ? And so you see him going... You see him, where would you even start on something like that? So he goes to Philippi. This is a more modern view of what was there. And he has been searching, and so therefore God sends someone to him to say, go to Philippi, go to Macedonia. Here's the first city he comes to. I think if we're not searching for somewhere to go, God isn't going to tell us. Why would he say, you know, you're supposed to go over here if we're not even paying attention? He wants to be believed as well. But when we're searching, when we're looking, certainly he gets this vision. He's told, go to Philippi. And he sees it as someone saying, come over here and help us. And that may be a big clue for what it is that we're looking for. There's no real scripture on it, but God has sent him out. Here is where he's supposed to go. He's coming to a big city. I mean, here's the football stadium. This is the place where they're supposed to be. This is an impressive thing. Here's one of the roadways that they go down. Here's some of the columns for the buildings that they have. And it is a beautiful, huge, big place that he's able to go to. But who's going to believe him there? How are you able to go there and have someone believe you? Well, there's three stories that we want to look at this morning that talk about evangelism and how Paul would do this. And so let's just jump right in. In Acts 16, 13, it says, And on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who had come together. And one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So they've come to a non-Jewish area, and yet there seems to be some people there who are worshipers of God. What does that mean? It's kind of hard to tell. There is no synagogue. He doesn't mention that. And furthermore, as he goes down to this riverside, to this place of prayer, he finds the whole crowd is women. And they're there to be able to be worshipers of God. But you know, if they don't have a priest, 
They don't have sacrifices. How well is that going to go? Certainly it's not going to be like the Jewish tradition of what they're trying to do to, to find God. But they're trying. They're trying the best they know how to be a worshiper of God. And so Paul comes to them. And it's kind of amazing to be able to find a person like Lydia there. So who's Lydia? Lydia is the one who owns the fabric shop. But it's more than that. This is royal fabric. And so she is probably the one who makes the cloth purple. And so she's the one who sells to the royalty. And so she's probably very well off. She owns her own business. She has her own family. Not at all like what you would see in Jerusalem with the people where the man is the head of the house and he runs everything. No, the first convert, she's the head of the house. There's no even mention of a husband. And so quite possibly you've got a single mom, a businesswoman, who is there in the first part of, of Paul's reach to that community. She works very hard and all the women come together and it makes you wonder what Paul said, doesn't it? How did he do that? What did he say? Because here's going to be the first one. This is great. What do you say to convince somebody that's from a faraway place? And, and what was his approach? Did he use the open Bible study, the Romans Road, the World Bible School? How did he do this? Maybe it was the We Care approach. And they had the Bible marked out. That, well, no, he hadn't written it all yet. So he would just have tags saying, I'm going to write this. That would be the best he could do. So, but, but what did he go to? What did he do? And it's interesting we don't have that. We have one phrase that explains why this was so successful. And it has nothing to do with Paul. God opened her heart to listen to Paul. Without that, I'm not sure anything makes sense. I'm not sure we get anywhere unless God starts by opening her heart first. We always think it's about us. We do the good job. We go win the world. We're the soldiers for Christ. We're the one that makes all the difference. And Paul says, no, you're not. We are the ones who talk to people where God has opened their heart. And they've been able to see. And I imagine the way Paul talks to her and the way that he approaches her has a lot to do with whether she's able to hear him. A lot of times we think there's some kind of magic method or manipulation of people into getting them to think just like we think so they'll see it our way. When all the time it's a God event. It's not our event. It's a God event that makes conversion possible as he opens the hearts of people to hear his word. Now it does mean we have to say something. It doesn't mean we can just sit there and they you know, absorb our look on our face for some reason. We do have to say something, but it is God giving an opportunity to work. And we are able to speak, and the way Paul shares, it's who he is. He is the message. He is the message that God has sent. And I say that more because of what comes next. And why would a person with that kind of credentials listen to him in the first place? Well, there had to be something about him and about the way he was able to do this that makes all the difference. Well, the next story doesn't go quite so well, but let's look at that one. Starting in verse 16, it says, And as they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So you've got a crazy girl. She's demon-possessed. She's a slave. But she's a fortune-teller. And as she walks around, is she believable? Well, she's made a lot of money. How do you make a lot of money at fortune telling? Because what you say is what people get. And, and it's true. You don't get very far if everything you say as a fortune teller is false. 
You know, you can go to the fortune teller and if they ask you, what do you want, leave. You ought to know what I want. I mean, you're the fortune teller. You're the one that should understand this and know about this. And she is able to do that and she walks around as the best advertisement they could ever get. She walks around saying something that is absolutely true. These are men of the most high God. These are men of the Most High God. Did you know these are men of the Most High God? You can't get a better endorsement than the fortune teller in town giving you that kind of credit, giving you that kind of praise. Well, after a few days, it kind of gets old. See, it doesn't work for us to carry around our own billboard saying, I'm a man of the Most High God. For some reason, still, people are not going to believe that. And how many came to Paul because of her? Well, there's none recorded here. Just because somebody says, oh, this is a guy who knows it all, does not seem to bring a great crowd of people who then become converted. Yeah, okay, he is. So what? I've got things to do. So what is it that makes evangelism possible? Well, Paul gets annoyed, and he's not annoyed at her, I don't think. He's annoyed at the spirit in her that is doing this, because it is not being helpful. It is not bringing any more people, even though there's somebody declaring the truth of who he is, and that ought to bring a crowd, we would think, you know, get your face on the TV or on the radio or something, and no, it's not quite doing that. And so as you look at all this, he casts the spirit out, and they no longer have a way to be able to make any money. Well, she already knows they're servants of God. Then what happens? How do you finish that conversation story? How do you can finish that conversion? And we have this interrupted because mainly there's no time. As soon as they figure that out, they decide you've ruined our business and after all, she's a slave. She's not free to do anything on her own or just come and talk to Paul. And so Paul is taken by the people, and there's no more contact. There's nothing else further that's going to happen here. She already knows they're servants of the Most High God. She would listen, right? But there's no finished conversion story. It is the beginning of one. Is there salvation here? Well, she's been saved from a demon. That's kind of impressive. She still has the influence of slavery, but there's no baptism recorded. She doesn't come to God. There's no worship because it's not about baptisms. But let me suggest that she's a whole lot closer than where she was. She was a slave who's demon-possessed and had never seen anybody from the Most High God. And now she's seen him and seen what he's able to do, and he's been able to cast the demon out of her. And what she knows is we don't have this end of the story, but what she knows is there's a man who stood up for her. And there's a man who cast the demon out of her. And then there's a man who paid the price of what that would mean to do that for her by being beaten and thrown in jail. In some of the stories, there's just no chance for completion. I'm not sure why we count those as losses or as unsuccessful. Because most of the time, you do not get to complete the whole process. You get to start. You get to have a little piece in the middle. You get to have something toward the end. And if you happen to be the last guy who says, Okay, I get to bring you to Christ, to baptize you into Christ so that your sins are washed away. Then we say, Ah, oh, he did it. No, there's a whole lot of people throughout their life that have influenced them to be able to come to Christ. And so evangelism, it's much bigger than one thing. And so the middle story is kind of one of those that we don't really feel good about for some reason because Paul has done an incredible job here of bringing a person who is demon-possessed to the point where she might be ready, but then there's just no opportunity. Well, then the last one is what happens, and that's in Acts 16, 22. So the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. 
And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into the prison and ordering the jailer to keep them safely. They received his order. He put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So Paul gets a lot of violence done to him for his good deeds. Some suggest this is the prison where Paul was kept. Looks pretty secure. You've got guards there. They tear their clothes, they beat them with rods, they put them in stocks. There's a lot of abuse for doing the right thing. It doesn't always work out well, does it? Because you said the right things, because you're servant of the Most High God, there's a lot of abuse that takes place, but it has more to do with the money. So how's this supposed to go? Isn't it God that sent him there? Isn't it God that said, I want you to go to Macedonia. We came to Philippi. We started preaching. Sure enough, this looks great. This looks like the spot because look at Lydia. She is so good. And she's already started and her whole household. And then we run into the crazy girl. And we can't finish it. And we, don't, we aren't making any progress. And I don't know if that's the reason why there's no other recorded ones in there at least. Or if they were able to baptize any others. But maybe if there's a crazy girl following around, it doesn't matter what she's yelling, nobody wants to talk to you. And so as you look at this whole process and what's going on here, you see how this works and, and Paul then gets thrown into prison and the question comes up, God, did you mean it? Did you really want me to come here? Why would you send me here and then not smooth out the way for a whole lot of things to happen? Why wouldn't you make this evangelistic tour a very brilliant way to say, here's how to do evangelism. Well, I think he did. It's just we miss the point a lot of times. Because we want to do it like we want to do it. We want to be the great teacher who comes in and explains, here's how you do it. Everybody listen to me, and then flocks of people come forward, and you just really don't see that. The only time you see that is when, you know, somebody's been crucified. And if you want to volunteer, we can try that. But I'm not sure it would work. There was thousands of years of history to set up Pentecost. There is no setup for Philippi. These people don't know anything. Except they know Paul. He's the one that they do know. And so the next thing that happens as they are in prison, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And the jailer woke and he saw the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. And Paul cried, with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out, and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were, with, who were in his house, and he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And they brought him up into the, his house, and he set food before them. And he rejoiced along with the entire, entire household that he had believed in God. He had no place to believe in God before this. So how is this a God plan? We should realize what's happening here. Paul gets thrown into the prison, right? How do you speak to prisoners? It's pretty difficult. How do you do prison ministry when you're one of them and you're being accused? And so Paul just starts singing. He and Silas, it's usually good to have somebody else, especially when you don't sound all that good. Silas may have been a good singer. So you start singing and you start praying because there's people around to listen. Why would you do that? 
because God sent you here. And so what does God want? He wants you to tell whoever you can tell about him. And we're in a spot now where the only people we can tell are the other prisoners around us. And what is it that's going to make a difference for them? Well, it's already late and they're probably all asleep, but Paul and Silas are singing. And it must have made a profound impact upon them. Because as God comes and shapes events with the earthquake that comes, you realize they don't run away. They're sitting there listening to these guys sing. What an incredible thing that is. And the earthquake comes and the, the doors fall open and their shackles fall off and the stalks are released and they're still sitting there listening to Paul and Silas sing. And the jailer may have been very close and I think, you know, at some point they're right there in it so they know that and once he gets fully awake, he realizes if he loses a prisoner, he will be put to death. And rather than somebody else put me to death, let me just do it. And so he pulls his sword and is ready to kill himself. And Paul points out the obvious, uh, don't do yourself any harm. We're all still here. That is absolutely unheard of. Why would they all still be there? Why in the world would they stay when you've got prison door wide open? Because we've never seen a man who's been beaten like that sing. He's singing about a God that's greater than anything we've ever heard of. And there is a time when we teach about God. And that's the time when people listen is when we sing when we out of our greatest problem out of our biggest distress that's when we sing at midnight the doors are chained the earthquake comes the doors are open why would a jailer listen to him or believe him because nobody ran away. Paul has taken over the prison because of who he is. Not because he forced them all to stay in and said, no, you can't leave, I've got to baptize this guy. He's not like that at all, but because they are so impressed with him and what he has gone through and the way he has gone through it and how much he suffered for Jesus and how much he has been able to do here in that moment. Paul is the message. And sometimes we think the message is just about the words that we say. But what I want to ask you today is what gives you the right to speak those words? You see, in this setting, Paul earned the right to say. And when you have that, it's pretty easy then. We keep wanting the magic approach. And I don't think it's really about a magic approach. Desperate people are God's opportunity. What must I do to be saved? And I doubt that he means from his sin. He probably means from Romans coming here, in here and killing him. It's not really a religious question. But the answer is always the same. I want you to believe in Jesus. When you believe in Jesus, it's going to straighten out all the things in your life. Because there's a man of peace, after what had been done to him, telling him how to get peace in his life. He's been beaten with rods by Roman soldiers. And a Roman soldier is now listening to him. And he tells him about Jesus, who was a man who was innocent, a man of peace, who was beaten by Roman soldiers. And he went to a cross and he died there. And he was innocent. And he was a man of peace. And he lived his life in such a way that people can change theirs and give you real strength. Not just because you got the keys to the jail cell, but all the prisoners are just sitting here and they're not running away. They're not leaving. 
And you know what happens? As soon as he realizes that, he goes, uh, can I shut your door to your jail cell, please, and lock it so you can't escape? Okay. I wasn't going anywhere anyway. And he and his family are baptized into Christ. He takes him, gives him food, washes his stripes, and he's there as a person who he is giving such extreme care to. Because the answer's for both. I'm going to save you from Roman soldiers, and I'm going to save you from your own self, and from your own sin, and from all the distress, and all the things that are going wrong in your life, and how much you don't have together. Just because you got keys and a sword, you think that gives you power and control over your life and it doesn't your life is really a mess and we think the same thing today that you know if we've got keys to the nice car and if we've got a great job and if we've got money in the bank and unless you've got some peace in your life and some kind of control in your life by God I'm not sure we really can claim that that's successful but what a great thing it is for Paul to be able to say to him, you just believe in Jesus Christ. And sometimes people want to pull that passage and say, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus. And that's what it says, because that's what you need to do. And he took him the same hour of the night and baptized him. Don't miss that part. Don't skip that part. I think that that's not an important part. That's an absolutely important part. So that now his sins can be washed away. So that now he can be that person of peace that he encountered when he was first introduced to Paul. Now he's able to sing. What an incredible place. Because as he's now come, he's a new creation. He's found that joy in Christ. He's found a way to live for something better than I can lock you up if I want to. Paul has more power than he does. What an amazing thing it is. Let me share with you one more story, and this one's not in our text, but it comes from Carrie Oberbrunner. And this is a story about an encounter between him and an older man, and when he was going to the local gym, he noticed a guy who was a little bit older, and he was messing with an MP3 player, and he couldn't get it to work, and he had the headphones, and he... You know, it, was, it just wasn't, wasn't working for him. He was getting really frustrated. And so he went over there and asked him if he could help. And the man said, hi, I'm Bob, and I love jazz, and I can't get this dumb player to work. And so Kerry asked Bob if he had heard of iTunes, and Bob shot back, I what? And it slowly dawned on Kerry that God had placed Bob in his path for a reason. So he set a date when they could spend some more time unraveling Bob's MP3 troubles. And it was against his initial wishes when he invisit, when Carrie had visited his apartment. It turns out his wife had died a couple of years before and all his earthly possessions were crammed into a small apartment. And she had been the main breadwinner and so the bank repossessed his house and he was unable to make payments. And Bob and I made a makeshift space in the back room near his desktop computer. One at a time, I imported his jazz CD collection onto his hard drive, intending to transfer to MP3, eventually to his player. You don't have to know how to do all that, by the way. While importing his music, Bob and I talked about life, about his wife, and about God. In the weeks followed, I checked on Bob often. It's kind of funny how two guys who are completely opposite can become best friends all because of an MP3 player. Bob is 71. Carrie says, I'm 32. Bob is black. I am white. Bob doesn't have much money. I have more than I need. Bob is an ex-convict. I've never been to jail. Bob is a widower. I'm married. In short, we're opposites. A short time later, I invited Bob to church, deeply desiring for him to meet Jesus. And after a few invitations, he eventually accepted and sat with my wife and me last spring. And if he felt awkward sitting in our mostly white church, he didn't let on. And it wasn't long before Bob confessed that he wanted to 
stop trying to control his life and to invite Jesus to take over. And so he became a Christian. He repented and was baptized. And when I looked into his eyes, I noticed the distinct peace that now defined his face. Bob changed my life and the life of the church because I get more joy from him than he'll ever understand. And whenever I say goodbye to him at the YMCA or hang up the phone after talking to him, he always tells me to give his family, to give his love to my family. So that's story number four. Which one do you identify with? See, sometimes we'll identify with Lydia because Lydia is a person more like us. She's got her life together, but it's not together. I mean, she's got money. She's got her own business. She's controlling her life. But when she finds out about God, she comes to him because she had been seeking and searching and not found the complete way yet. And Paul is one of those guys, as we can tell about him by the whole story, that she must have been impressed with. Because he is a messenger of God. And then the crazy girl, maybe we identify with the crazy girl because that's what it seems everybody around us is really annoying to us. And uh, we're just trying to be able to get by and trying to be able to get our life together. And, you know, so if we could cast out a few demons or a few people, we'd like it. You know, Paul never does tell her to go away. He just casts out the demon. Or maybe we identify more with the jailer where we don't have a clue about God. We didn't have any background or anything. We're Roman. We're not Jewish. We're not any part of this. We've never been to Bible class and don't know a thing about it. But when he's confronted with a man who is able to control freedom, it's like that guy's got something I don't got. And I'm a jailer and I thought I had the keys to freedom. And I don't. And he does. And so he listens to him because he understands what it's all about. Here's a guy who can take a room full of prisoners and make them sit still when their chains fall off. And I put the last story in because some of you won't relate to any Bible story whatsoever at all. And the only one you're going to relate to is an email story. So I put that one in for you, okay? And unless it's at your gym or at some place and in a local setting, you're going to go, I don't get it. It doesn't mean anything. But they're all the same story. It's all a story about somebody who cared enough to be able to talk And somebody who was enough of a person of God to be able to reach out to them and to do for them so that they were able to see God. And then the speaking part's easy. But they got to see your heart. They got to see God's heart first. And they got to see that you're different from everybody else. You didn't just come with a sales pitch. You're not just carrying a projector under your arm hoping to get lucky. He says, You came because you care. Because you have compassion. And then even if you were abused, you would take it as a way for God to be able to speak to other people who are abused. And that God is in all of your life. And God is in every part. And when we do it that way, I think evangelism explodes. And you see Philippi as here's just the first few. I imagine there's a whole lot more. And so if you've heard the story of Jesus, then can you let him change your life today? Maybe it's time for you to repent and to be baptized into Christ. And maybe you're not a person of peace right now and you need to be. Maybe you need to find that kind of peace that says, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I understand God's going to make things better. Maybe that's where you are today. And so if you are, then we would love to be able to help you with that. If you're not, then go find somebody. Be Paul to them. Be the person who shows what that's like. However we can help you today, we want to. Come while we stand and sing.